Um, so the, the title of the book is Alexis in America, a Russian Grand Duke's Tour, 1871 to 72. And so this year and into the into early next year is 150th anniversary of this event. Um, now, when we, I talk about Alexis, one of the things that people usually ask is why did um, why did the czar choose to send his son Alexis to the United States and why at that particular moment? So you can go ahead and click to the next slide, Hannah. Um, and there are some really good um, reasons that Alexis came to the United States when he did. So as I said, the United States and Russia had a very good relationship in the 19th century. We had an active trade uh, interaction. Uh, of course, in 1867, the United States had bought Russia, had bought Alaska from Russia, um, and that was a good deal for both parties. Um, and some of you may also know that during the Civil War in 1863, Russia had sent a fleet to the United States. Um, and although Russia had its own reasons for doing so, in the United States, in the North at least, that was seen as um, a sign of support uh, for the Union. And so there were very favorable feelings toward Russia uh, during this time. Alexander II, Alexis's father, had liberated the serfs in 1861, and Lincoln had uh, liberated the slaves in 1863. So the two countries also saw some similarities and some companionship over the, these shared experiences. And then, of course, there had also been, for those of you who maybe don't know, an, an assassination attempt against um, Alexander II. Um, and there was a of course, the assassination of Lincoln. So there, there were some things that also made the two countries feel like they had something in common. In 1871, of course, the Civil War was over. Um, the United States was sort of repairing itself and redefining itself. Russia had also gone through some significant reforms, including the um, abolition of serfdom. And so it seemed like a good time to redefine and maybe cement that Russian-American friendship. So Alexander II had some very good reasons to want to send a visitor to the United States. The question, of course, is why Alexis? Because Alexis was the fourth son, so he was not the heir to the throne. There were several other children who could have been sent, um, but, Alex but Alexander and his wife had a very good reason for wanting to get Alexis out of Russia for a for a period of time. And this is because Alexis was in love. So Alexis was born in 1850. So in 1871, he was just 21 years old and he was in love with a much older woman. She's pictured down at the lower right hand side of this slide. Her name was Alexandra Zhukovska. She was descended from Russian nobility. Um, her her uh, father actually was a, a Russian poet and had been a Russian tutor uh, to the royal family. But uh, she was not nobility. And while it would have been fine for Alexis to have an affair with her once he was happily married and doing his duty to the throne, um, he could not marry her. Um, he, um, he, he couldn't marry her. He needed to marry somebody from uh, a royal family. But Alexis was quite in love with her and he wanted to marry her. And in fact, in January of 1871, she was already expecting his child. Um, and so Alexander II and his wife were eager to, um, to try and get Alexis to forget this woman um, or to at least separate him from her from an extended period of time. And so, um, so it was decided to send uh, Alexis to the United States um, and, and on an extended journey to, to sort of squash this relationship. And Alexis was quite upset about this. He really loved her. He wanted to marry her. He made that very clear in letters to his parents. Um, and as I've told people before, in reading his letters to his parents, um, it almost felt voyeuristic because the letters were very emotional and they sounded exactly like you would expect them to sound, um, you know, where a, a son is pleading with his parents to let him marry the woman that he loves um, and, and telling them that he has this duty to her and the parents are saying enough of this we're tired of talking about it you can't marry her you're you know you're going to continue to travel and and you're not coming home until you sort of get over this um so there's a really interesting story behind it and i'll i'll conclude the story at the end of the um at the end of the presentation so we can move on to the next slide so 
even though this was a visit that was intended to redefine and cement Russian-American relations, um, there were some threats to a good visit. The first was a Polish assassination plot. So before Alexis even um, arrived in the United States, the Russian minister who's pictured on the left and whose name is at the bottom, Konstantin Kadakazi, informed our Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, that he had, been, he had been told that there was a plot by Polish nationals living in New York City to uh, assassinate Alexis when he arrived in the United States. And there was some significant investigation of this and they could never really uncover the certainty of a plot, but there was enough evidence about it um, that it was decided that agents from Pinkerton's detective agency would travel with the Grand Duke for at least part of the trip to ensure his, his safety. So that was one potential threat. The second potential threat was something called the Perkins claim. And um, this was a lawsuit filed by uh, an American citizen against the Russian government. Um, it was a claim from a defaulted agreement back from the Crimean War in the 1850s. And over the decades, this, um, this man, Perkins, and then ultimately his heirs were attempting to get this matter resolved. Um, and they kept appealing to the United States government to intervene on their behalf. Um, they appealed to the Russian government to settle the claim. Um, and there were some American politicians who took this claim very seriously. And in fact, when it was time for the Alaska purchase, there was a significant movement to try and withhold a certain amount of money from the Alaska payment until the Russian government looked at this claim again. Um, Ultimately, of course, the Alaska sale went through as planned, but uh, it was done so with the promise that the Russian government was going to revisit this issue. And so when the new Russian minister arrived in September of 1869, and that was Konstantin Kadakazi, um, he was tasked by the Russian government with re-examining this claim. Uh, and Konstantin Kadakazi was convinced from the beginning that the claim was false and that it had been exaggerated and that the money was um, being promised to politicians, or at least part of it was. And that's why uh, there was such a keen interest in it. He even claimed that President Grant um, was, uh, was someone who would benefit from uh, the settlement of the claim. And this was only one of a number of things that Kadakazi did to really make himself disliked by the American government. Uh, Kadakazi was um, apparently kind of a prickly individual. He was described by someone as odious and disagreeable, which I think is a phenomenal phrase. Um, the one I hope no, no one ever uses it about me. Um, and, um, and so he became very disliked in the American government. He had a bad habit of somehow getting information into the American newspapers, either by writing articles himself or by talking to reporters. Um, and sometimes these articles were um, critical of people within the U.S. government or critical of U.S. policy. Sometimes they just seem to be sort of leaking information or misleading uh, or placing misleading information in the newspapers. And, um, and so he was seen as a problem. And so it was decided um, by the early summer of 1871 that he needed to go. And so Hamilton Fish sent uh, a letter to our minister in St. Petersburg requesting that the Russian government recall this minister. And um, needless to say, that was a kind of a scandalous thing to ask for in the first place, though not unprecedented. Uh, but of course, the other problem was that Alexis at this point was, um, was you know, already preparing to depart for the United States. He was supposed to leave in August. And so the Russian government made it clear that there was no way that the, the Grand Duke's visit could proceed if there was no Russian minister present. So it was decided on the part of the United States government that they would tolerate Konstantin Kadakazi until the end of the Grand Duke's visit, but he would be persona non grata uh, and he would only be allowed to interact with government officials to the degree that it was necessary for the Grand Duke's visit. So this caused, you know, quite, um, quite a, 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 a tension and some scandal right before the Grand Duke's visit. Uh, there were people who worried that the Grand Duke's visit would be canceled. Um, and ultimately it did sort of cast a pall over the visit when, um, when he was in Washington. Okay, so we can go on to the next slide.
So this is a map that shows the Grand Duke's travels. He went to over 14 cities, 14 major cities and some small cities within the United States. Um, and he also went to three cities in Canada. Um, when I was doing research for this project, I went to every place he went um, and did research at the local historical societies and public libraries um, using their um, primary source collections or document collections, um, looking at letters. Um, there are still menus and banquet invitations and um, other things like that that are extant today. Um, and, um, and I also looked at newspapers on microfilm from all of these cities from 1871 and 72. So you can imagine this was a fun research project for me. Um, but you can also see that the Grand Duke covered a lot of territory in a three month period. And this actually makes one his visit unique um, compared to some other uh, famous visitors in the United States, such as Lafayette or Mark Twain. Uh, I, I'm sorry, not Tw Twain, Dickens. Um, because although some of these other people came and traveled in the United States, they didn't cover as much territory. And Alexis's visit was um, designed in such a way that in the major cities, there were these balls and festivities that were really kind of only exclusively for the well-to-do in the city. But because he traveled so much, he was, he, he was in a lot of parades and, um, and his train, of course, traveled a great deal. And so people came out in droves at all sorts of places to see him. So average folks actually had the opportunity to see the Grand Duke or at least see his train go by. And this increased public awareness and public interest in this visit in a way that was probably not true for some of those other famous visitors in the 19th century. Lots of people uh, described going out to train depots or along train lines or, or to, you know, to the crowded streets in a city to see the Grand Duke go by. And I think that makes this visit particularly interesting as compared to some other events in the 19th century. Next slide. So not surprisingly, the first stop for the Grand Duke visit was New York City. And in all of the cities, all the major cities that Alexis visited, um, of course, he was feted with balls and parades and banquets. And as I said a moment ago, these really were um, hosted by and designed for the well-to-do in each city. So politicians, uh, businessmen, and then also some other people sort of, you know, like scientific and literary luminaries of the time were often involved in the Grand Duke's reception in some way. Uh, so in New York City, when he um, when he arrived, there was an enormous parade down Broadway, um, and then um, and then during his time there, there were various banquets and and balls and theater performances that were held for him. Next slide. After he went to New York City, where his initial reception was, he then went to D.C. to meet. President Grant and Secretary of State Hamilton Fish. And as I said a few minutes ago, the visit here was quite different and it was really out of character with the visit in all the other cities. So in Washington, the Grand Duke met the president, Hamilton Fish, other members of the cabinet and their wives, but there was no ball, there was no dinner and the speeches were kept to a minimum. Uh, so his visit there was definitely negatively impacted by the tensions caused by the Russian minister. The Russian minister was actually present for this, um, and um, but he was sort of, you know, sort of in the background to the extent that that could be possible because Grant and Fish wanted nothing to do with them. Next slide. The Grand Duke also went to Philadelphia. Um, and here you can see a copy of uh, an invitation at the bottom, a reception invitation. Um, and he stayed at the Continental Hotel in Philadelphia. Uh, here he met other famous politicians and historical figures. One of them was General George Meade, who was the hero of Gettysburg. And as in other cities, he was wined and dined and, and feted. And I should mention to you that, you know, in all of these cities, of course, the Grand Duke was housed in the best hotel of the city. Um, and the cost of these events was paid for by the citizens of the various cities. Um, so while the reception in DC, minimal as it was, was paid for by the government, in other cities, it was the citizens who got together 
And they raised funds through various ways, selling tickets and so on. Um, sometimes the wealthiest citizens donated carriages and those sorts of things. And, um, and in this way, the private citizens of these various cities paid for the Grand Duke's reception. The Grand Duke usually paid for his own hotel bill, however. Next slide. The Grand Duke also went to Boston and here he visited City Hall and he visited the old State House and other, um, other famous sites. He visited the Massachusetts Historical Society. And actually on Tuesday, or on Wednesday this week, I gave a, a lecture there in person at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, and I focused specifically on his visit to Boston because he visited the Massachusetts Historical Society and there he was shown, um, well, there, there they presented to the Massachusetts Historical Society with some leaves, some oak leaves. And the story behind this is that years before, uh, Charles Sumner's younger brother had brought an acorn to Russia as a gift. And it was an acorn from the grave, a tree near the grave of George Washington. Uh, that um, that uh, acorn was planted in Russia. It grew into a tree. Um, and years later, when uh, Gustavus Vasa Fox was in Russia, he was shown that tree that had resulted from that acorn. And now years later, uh, Alexis and his, uh, his traveling companion, the Admiral um, uh, Constantine Posyet, uh, brought with them leaves from that oak tree to present to the Massachusetts Historical Society. And they have those, um, and they have those on display right now, as a matter of fact. So that, that's an interesting kind of connection there. While the Alexis was in Boston, there was of course a ball and several dinners. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, interestingly enough, was attending uh, several of those events, was in attendance at several of those events, as was Louisa May Alcott. So Louisa May Alcott, who was already a famous author at this, at this point, um, was at the ball for Alexis. And she made a funny comment about how Alexis was dancing with all the pretty young women, but leaving uh, the old dowagers uh, in the corner. And this was this is a funny thing because throughout the Grand Duke's visit, the American press paid a lot of attention to his um, female dancing partners. Uh, there were rumors that Alexis was hunting for a bride in the United States. As we know, that wasn't true. He was still very much in love with Alexandra Zhukovskaya, but you can imagine that you know the American public wanted to believe this and it was a good news story. So all the newspapers constantly talked about who he was dancing with. And of course, in many cities, he was sort of forced to dance with the wives of these politicians and so on, right? Because everybody would want to dance with the young handsome prince. Um, and uh, and there, were, there were jokes and references to Alexis not being allowed to choose his own dance partner. So Louisa May Alcott's comment is sort of funny in that context. Next slide. So from Boston, Alexis went north and here he visited Ottawa, Montreal and Toronto. And as part of that visit, he also visited Niagara Falls. Um, and you know the descriptions of that are very much like the descriptions of a visit to Niagara Falls today. So you know they talk about going under the falls and wearing these special uh, costumes uh, to protect themselves from the water. Um, and of course, you know, it's not surprising that given the spectacular nature of that, um, of that location that Alexis was taken there. Next slide. From Niagara Falls, Alexis went to Buffalo, Cleveland, and Detroit. But the next city on his stop was really much more interesting. Alexis visited Chicago only weeks after the Great Fire. So the Great Fire had happened in early October of 1871. Alexis was in Chicago about six weeks later, um, and it was um, and it was sort of interesting and amazing that Chicago managed to pull this off. City officials very much wanted to show that they could host the Grand Duke and that Chicago would rebuild itself and be a great city again. And so it was it was a point of pride. Um, and uh, it, it, reminded, it reminds me of, you know, sort of what happened after 
Katrina in New Orleans, right? There was a strong feeling that it's important to show the world that we can rebuild and that we will be back to our former greatness. And Chicago had that feeling. So they chose to invite the Grand Duke and he he did decide to go there and he was um, he was brought to tour the burn districts and um, and Chicago, you know, gave him a good reception, just like many of the other cities. Next slide. From uh, Chicago, Alexis visited Milwaukee. Um, and this is it's interesting in Milwaukee, there was actually some opposition to Alexis's visit from German citizens living there. So um, as I'll sort of talk about at the very end of the presentation, not everyone was thrilled about the Grand Duke coming to the United States, and not everyone was thrilled about uh, any kind of um, reception for him. Alexis, after all, came from a monarchy. Um, and so there were some questions about why we should be hosting uh, a, a member of a royal family. After all, the United States was supposed to have uh, created itself to get away from that sort of thing. Um, but for some citizens, um, especially those who had moved to the United States to get away from repressive governments, they saw it as particularly offensive. And so there were a number of German citizens who had come to the United States um, after the revolutions of 1848. Um, and so they were not thrilled about the idea of Milwaukee hosting uh, a member of the Russian royal family, which of course represented um, monarchy. Um, and uh, ultimately their complaints went nowhere, but uh, they were pretty vocal about them. So next slide, please. After um, Milwaukee, Alexis went to St. Louis. Um, and one of the things I'll mention here is that along the way, Alexis visited not only the, uh, the social uh, scene of each city, but he also visited um, engineering and industrial and educational uh, facilities as well. So uh, in Chicago, he had visited a, a pork packing plant. Um, in other cities, he visited um, prisons, he visited factories of very, various sorts. In St. Louis, he visited um, a famous bridge. Um, and, and along the way, he expressed interest in these various um, things. And of course, the city officials were happy to show off their engineering and technical um, and industrial uh, facilities. Um, but Alexis actually seemed to be interested in these things. And in some places, he requested blueprints. In some places, he took home samples of items, um, all with the intent of bringing this information back to Russia for possible use in Russia or some kind of possible connections between Russia and the United States. In some cases, maybe trade or some kind of other um, uh, technical purchases. Next slide. The next part of the Grand Duke's visit is actually the one that is probably most known. So people who are very interested in the West, who are interested in Buffalo Bill or Custer are usually familiar with this part of the Grand Duke's visit. So the Grand Duke went out West and he participated in a Buffalo hunt in, um, in Nebraska. And there is a very small town named Hayes Center, Nebraska, which, which has about 200 people in it last time I checked. Um, and not far from there is the actual campsite where the Grand Duke's hunt took place. And as I said, participants in that hunt included Buffalo Bill and Custer. Um, so here's where that Russian Forrest Gump thing comes in. Um, and, um, and the visit was reported on, or the hunt was reported on by a reporter who traveled with them. This is the account that I have used in my book to describe the buffalo hunt because there are also some very colorful versions uh, that uh, were later published by Buffalo Bill. So of course we have to remember Buffalo Bill was a showman. And so he published his own memoirs which included accounts of the buffalo hunt several times and the, the various versions are not always consistent. And they talk about things like, you know, Alexis not being a very good shot and needing help. This is not very likely. Alexis had already had experience hunting in Russia, so uh, he was likely a very good shot. Certainly, he wouldn't have needed help from Buffalo Bill to shoot something as large as a buffalo or bison, um, but um, 
Buffalo Bill tells some very colorful versions of this story. But in any event, the hunt was a great success. Uh, the stories from several people say that every time Alexis, you know, shot a buffalo, there would be the popping of champagne corks and and the and the celebration that followed. Uh, so people were very uh, happy when Alexis was successful hunting. Um, there was also a visit by some Native Americans who came, uh, the Brule from the Brule Sioux tribe. They had been specially invite, invited to come and uh, perform for the Grand Duke because Alexis had expressed interest in seeing Native Americans. Um, and of course, later on, we know that uh, Buffalo Bill would take uh, Native Americans to Russia as part of his traveling Western show. Um, but um, the visit in the West was very successful. Um, Alexis also went to Denver where there was a proper uh, ho hotel and a ball and a dinner and those sorts of things. But the, bu the Buffalo hunt itself was by far the most colorful part of the Grand Duke's visit and especially of his visit out West. Next slide. So you can see here, this is an actual picture of uh, Custer with, um, with Alexis. And at the bottom of the picture, I think you can see there are some Buffalo tails. Next slide. From the West, Alexis went back toward um, the Midwest and the South. Um, so he visited Louisville, Kentucky, um, and he actually went inside of Mammoth Cave. Next slide. From there, he traveled to Memphis where he was hosted at the Peabody Hotel. Unfortunately, it's not the same Peabody that stands today. And the Peabody that stands today seems to have no records of this visit. So um, I, I checked, they don't have anything, unfortunately. Um, but while he was in Memphis, of course, there were the requisite balls and, and banquets. And while he was in Memphis, he met uh, the former Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. Um, and his traveling companion, the Admiral, wrote that um, Jefferson Davis seemed like a nice guy and that it was um, it was hard to imagine that he had been on the quote wrong side of things. Next slide. From Memphis, Alexis traveled by riverboat down to New Orleans. And this is another part of the Grand Duke's visit that is more widely known. It's, it's in New Orleans, uh, in the newspaper every year around Mardi Gras time, there's some mention of Grand Duke Alexis. Uh, so Alexis was in New Orleans for the first daytime Mardi Gras celebration. So many of you probably know that Mardi Gras originated in Mobile, and then eventually it made its way to New Orleans. Uh, for many years, the celebrations were at night, and they were very unorganized. Um, and so there, there was no attempt to, um, to mandate what people did or how they dressed or that sort of thing. In 1872, uh, an organization was created called the Crew of Rex, which of course is one of the oldest organizations, Mardi Gras organizations in New Orleans. And that year there was an attempt to actually organize a daytime procession um, with guidelines and, and expectations. And, um, and this occurred um, in coordination with the Grand Duke's visit. So one of the myths about this is that the Grand Duke inspired all of this. That's actually not really true. It's clear that there was already some interest in organizing Mardi Gras a little more for, for tourism purposes and other reasons before the Grand Duke's uh, visit to uh, New Orleans. Um, but the fact that he was on the way um, makes it makes it coincidental and, and, and easy to connect the two. The other thing that's interesting um, that is part of the sort of lore, popular lore about Mardi Gras and Alexis is that the crew of Alexis, I'm sorry, the crew of Rex's um, theme song is If Ever I Cease to Love. This song was a song that was being performed um, in a... Um, in a musical, a vaudeville, or not a vaudeville, a burlesque musical called Bluebeard uh, by Lydia Thompson, a woman named Lydia Thompson. It was a very popular song. So people were already very much aware of this song, but there was a rumor in the American press that Alexis had fallen in love with Lydia Thompson because in another city, he had seen her perform and given her a lavish bracelet. Now, this was not atypical. Alexis actually gave a lot of fancy gifts while he was traveling through the United States. 
But as I said before, there was a great interest in the American press and the American public uh, in believing that Alexis was here to find a wife um, and that he was you know, chasing women all over the United States. And so this story about Alexis and Lydia sort of stuck. And, um, and so then when Rex chose their theme song, If Ever I Cease to Love, it was said that they chose it as sort of a playful mocking of Alexis when he came to visit. Um, and Lydia Thompson was actually performing um, in New Orleans around the same time. Again, it's not true, but the, the myth has persisted. And so every year you'll see something about this in, um, in Mardi Gras, in, in newspapers or on websites regarding Mardi Gras. Um, and although I wrote an article disproving this entire thing, the myth still continues because it's a good story and people would like to believe it. Next part. So not surprisingly, um, Alexis's visit um, provoked a lot of interesting reactions. Um, so there was a lot of advertising using Alexis's name. Uh, so there were both uh, products and fashions that were created that were named after him. So there was a, an Alexis hair tonic for sale. There were Alexis shoes for sale. Um, there was a lot of Russian themed jewelry that appeared for sale in newspapers. But also stores would sometimes use, sometimes use Alexis's name as, a, as, a, as an advertising point. So for example, they would say, you know, uh, men who are going to be going to the, uh, the Grand Duke Alexis Ball should come and get their hats here at our store. Or, you know, Alexis admired this sewing machine and therefore he's, and said he wants to bring one back to Russia. So all of you should come and get a sewing machine here. Um, like the one Alexis admired. So there, and this was, by the way, one of the first times that that stores used a celebrity to advertise as opposed to just advertising what their products were. So prior to this, you'd see a store just advertising, we've got these goods. This was actually an attempt to co-op that excitement of Alexis and use it to sell things. Um, so that's a very interesting thing. Uh, there was also a lot of really bad poetry written and published for Alexis's visit. Uh, so this is just an excerpt from one poem. I have about 25 of these that I've collected from various newspapers. There were a lot of very bad rhymes made with the name Alexis. So as you can see here, um, there's a Muscovite youth named Alexis, who's an, who an officer first of the deck is, and he came here to see what this country might be air I land to his own he annexes. So anything that rhymed with Alexis, including, including Texas and any other thing you can think of was jammed into a poem somehow um, and published in, in newspapers around the country. And then finally, as I said, you know, there were lots of stories about women um, chasing uh, Grand Duke Alexis and, and Alexis being interested in the women. So there were some really kind of embarrassing stories about women following him around the country or women waiting in the lobby of the hotel he was staying at to try and meet him. Um, the newspapers constantly referred to who Alexis danced with. They referred to the dress of the women at the ball. They talked about, you know, the fact that women were, you know, pestering their fathers to spend lots of money so they could go to this ball and meet the young, handsome Duke. So um, a lot was made of Alexis as an eligible bachelor. Next slide. One of the most interesting things that I discovered in my research was how the visit has been remembered over time. So one of the things that I discovered, of course, and this is not surprising, that if, the, if someone was living in one of the cities where Alexis visited um, and they were a letter writer, and of course, lots of people were back then, uh, their letters often mentioned this. So, um, so, we, um, so we have letters in various collections around the country. Um, where people talk about the Grand Duke's visit. And sometimes it's just in passing, but sometimes it's a little more, especially if they've, um, if they've seen the Grand Duke um, in a parade or if they've been lucky enough to attend one of the balls. Even more interesting, I think, is that Alexis's name appeared later in wedding announcements. And what I mean by this is if a young woman was fortunate enough to dance with Grand Duke Alexis while he was in her city, when she later got married, that was sometimes mentioned in the wedding announcement, which I think is just 
fascinating. So among the other information about like who the bride's parents were and so on and so forth, they would say, you know, like Miss so-and-so, uh, you know, of this place who's marrying this person danced with Grand Duke Alexis when he was in this city. And I just think that's such an odd thing to add to a wedding announcement, but it really does show um, what an interesting, what, a, what an important thing that was for people at the time. And similarly, later I found mention of Grand Duke Alexis in obituaries. So if a, um, if a particularly famous caterer or the manager of a hotel had been involved in the Grand Duke's reception, years later when he died, it would be mentioned in the obituary that he had been the host of Grand Duke Alexis, that he had been the person in charge of the reception of Grand Duke Alexis in that city. So I just think those are fascinating um, cultural signs of just how important Grand Duke Alexis's visit was. Since the visit ended, um, since you know many years after the visit, um, there have been other ways in which places have attempted to uh, to commemorate the visit. So there have been a number of museum exhibits that have talked about the Grand Duke's visit. Uh, there have also been commemorative balls and also some commemorative dinners. And in some cases, these dinners have attempted to actually um, recreate the menu uh, from the dinner. And these menus were quite extravagant and, 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 um, and quite abundant. So this is no small feat, uh, but there've been a number of places that have attempted to do that. And then finally, I think this is particularly interesting as well. In 1924, an, a Mardi Gras organization was founded in New Orleans called the Crew of Alexis. Now, initially it lasted for only four years and I never could find out why it, it was disbanded then. But many years later in 1975, this organization was refounded, I suppose, and it continues to exist to this day. Um, and it's one of the organizations that does not have a parade, but they do have a ball and the ball is Russian themed. So every year they pick some theme from Russian history and the participants dress in costumes that are supposed to represent that period in Russian history. And they give away, um, they call them ball favors. And the ball favor is something related to the Grand Duke Alexis or Russia. So for example, um, you know, it could, it might be a coin, it might be an ashtray, it might be a wine glass that has something Russian on it, or like an insignia of the Romanov family, something like that. Next slide. Two other uh, indications of how the Grand Duke's visit have been, um, has been remembered. Um, are here on this slide. So on the right hand side, this is a buffalo head that is on display at the New York Yacht Club. And it is supposedly a buffalo head from the actual buffalo hunt. The story is that after the buffalo hunt, Alexis gave this as a gift to the, uh, the merchant who had supplied a lot of the goods for the hunt, um, the food and such uh, that, they, that they used while they were out there. And, um, and then Alexis, then the, the merchant held on to the Buffalo head for a number of years and eventually it was donated to the New York Yacht Club. And it hangs in their, in their, um, their offices there. Um, at least the last time I visited, it was still there. And on the left is a brochure from something that, um, that existed for 10 years. Unfortunately, it does not occur anymore. And this was something called the Grand Duke Alexis Rendezvous. And it was held in Hay Center, Nebraska, that tiny town that I mentioned. Um, it was put on by the Lions Club. And it was a two, three day event where um, people would come dressed in costume for the characters who had been part of the Buffalo Hunt. So you can see the picture there shows the man in the foreground is Grand Duke Alexis. Obviously the man playing the part was much older than the Grand Duke was at the time because Alexis turned 22 during the Grand Duke, I'm sorry, during the Buffalo hunt. Um, and in the top photo, you can see the guy who played Buffalo Bill and there's somebody who played Custer. And then there were other people who came dressed as sort of other, um, you know, mountain men. Um, 
And, uh, and these people would come and they would stay on the premises and um, they would camp out for several days and other people would come as well. Mountain men from the area would travel and come and, and, and camp out there and they would be dressed in period garb and they would be cooking over fires and so on. And they would also do presentations where uh, the Grand Duke Alexis and Buffalo Bill and Custer would talk about the hunt in character and they would attempt to stay in character all weekend long. This was an, I actually was fortunate enough to attend this event, event several times uh, while I was doing research for the book. And it was a lot of fun. And it's, it's really unfortunate that it's not happening anymore. Uh, the, the reality was just that the people who had started hosting it um, were already pretty old uh, when they started. And by the end, they just weren't up to it anymore. And there were no young people in the town who wanted to con continue it. And so it's sort of fallen by uh, the wayside. But it was a really amazing uh, event held every year specifically to commemorate this event. And they would, um, they would take people out to see the actual campsite. There are several mar markers that show where the actual campsite took place. So unfortunately, it's not going on anymore, but there are still markers to show where the Grand Duke's uh, buffalo hunt took place. Next slide. So just to sort of wrap up the story for you, you probably want to know what happened to Alex, uh, Alexis after he left the United States. So while Alexis was traveling through the U.S., as I said, he was very much in love with um, Zhukovskaya, and he continued to mourn her absence and mourn his separation from her. And Admiral Posyet, who traveled with him, was constantly reporting back to the Tsar about Alexis's mood. So he wrote letters back to the Tsar telling him Alexis is still crying about uh, Zhukovskaya. He still is very sad um, about being separated from her. Um, and, you know, I'm quite actually nervous that she might show up in one of these ports. And, um, and so I'm on the lookout for this. And so it was decided that Alexis's visit would continue. Uh, and so when he left the United States, when he left New Orleans, he stopped in Mobile for just an hour or so. And then he went to Pensacola, where he connected with the Russian fleet. And from there, they went to South America. Eventually, they they traveled east. They went as far as Japan before Alexis returned home. Um, and eventually, I hope I'll be able to do research in some of those other parts of uh, Grand Duke Alexis's visit. Um, but uh, it was about two years by the time Alexis got back to Russia. Throughout that time he was traveling, however, uh, Admiral Posyet was on alert because he was really worried that Zhukovskaya might show up in one of these ports or that Alexis might try and meet her somewhere. So uh, it, was, it was a very serious thing for uh, the Russian royal family to keep him away from this woman. In the meantime, uh, uh, Zhukovskaya gave birth to his son. Um, actually, uh, just about the day he was arriving in the United States, she gave birth to his son. Um, she, um, she named the child Alexis after his father. Eventually, she took the child and moved to Germany, and she married someone else. But years later, uh, the young Alexis was brought back to Russia, and he, he actually became a member of the Russian court again. Um, and apparently, he was very well uh, treated by the royal family. He was accepted by them. And uh, the last empress, Alexandra, was actually godmother to one of his children. So that shows that he was brought back into the family. I don't know how much um, contact Alexis, the father, had with his son. I was never able to uh, uncover any connections between them. So I don't know that they had much of a relationship act after uh, the young Alexis came back to Russia. Grand Duke Alexis himself, when he returned to Russia in, um, in 1873, um, continued uh, as heir, I'm sorry, as one of the royal sons to serve in the Navy as he had uh, for all these years already. Um, he eventually became head of the Russian Navy. Unfortunately, this was not a good thing for Alexis. He really wasn't that interested in the Russian Navy. He wasn't that interested in heading the Russian Navy. Um, and so there were lots of sort of um, humorous comments about Alexis that he was more interested in women than ships. Um, he was actually, um, there, there, were, there was a funny line someone said about him that he liked fast women and slow ships. 
Um, and there were other jokes that said that um, every time Alexis had a new girlfriend, this was bad for the Russian Navy because the money would be spent on uh, on the girlfriend instead of the Russian Navy. Uh, ultimately, Alexis was the, still the head of the Navy at the time of the Russo-Japanese War, which is what that poster in the center uh, illustrates. And of course, the Russo-Japanese War was a terrible defeat for Russia. And so Alexis left the Navy somewhat in disgrace, um, and he moved to Paris where he died in 1908 of, uh, of kidney disease. So Alexis, Alexis had a sad life in the end, I think. Um, he, he never was reconciled with Zhukovsky. He never married. He had lots of girlfriends over the years, but he never really settled down. Um, and, and ultimately he died in Paris in 1908, um, never having have never having married and nor had he had any more children. Um, the only positive thing we can say about the fact that Alexis died in 1908 is that he was spared the trauma of the Russian Revolution. So oftentimes people ask me what happened to Alexis during the Russian Revolution. He was actually dead for quite some years before that traumatic event occurred. The photographs on the right are of the building that he lived in in, uh, in Paris. So when I was in Paris a couple of years ago, I tracked down his his residence there and, and had my picture taken in front of it. Next slide. And that is the end of the Grand Duke story. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Here, uh, we have a few questions already from our attendees. And let me see, the very first one I see is from Conrad Phillips, who says, to what extent did the tour succeed? Uh, was it a successful diversion? You kind of answered this a little bit, but if you'd like to elaborate more on this inquiry. So I think it, it, was, a very, it was a very successful visit. It was very positive in many ways. Unfortunately, this was sort of the, the highlight of Russian-American relations um, because from that point forward, things tended to go downhill. Uh, there was, of course, the scandal involving the Russian minister and then 10 years later, when Alexis's father, Alexander II, was assassinated by terrorists and succeeded by his much more conservative son, it became much more difficult for the United States and Russia to find things in common. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, from that point forward, Russian American relations sort of go downhill, but it was a very successful visit in many ways. All right, thank you. Uh, the next inquiry is from Roy, who asks, uh, which languages did Alexis speak during this tour? Was it English, Russian, French, a mixture? So Alexis uh, spoke English very well. He had been trained to speak English and French and German. And so when he was in the United States, he spoke English when he was interacting with Americans. And he was, and several people commented on how good his English was. All right, thank you. And then two individuals have actually asked very similar questions, so I will put them together. Uh, Mark begins by asking, well, why did he go to Canada on this tour? And Carolyn would like to know a few more details about the public engagements in Canada and how he was received there. Okay, so um, in Canada, so he was he was invited to uh, visit Canada. Um, and so that was so that was part of the trip. And it was quite easy to to move north from where he was already traveling. Um, and the the events in Canada were actually um, quite subdued compared to the events in the United States. And that is because uh, the Prince of Wales was sick at the time. Um, and it was he was actually potentially on death's door. And so it was decided that the kind of big celebrations that might have been held should not be held out of respect for that. Um, so the visits in those cities were, he was taken to the same kinds of places that he was taken in the United States. So he was taken to see, you know, all of the nice, nice uh, facilities, government facilities, that sort of thing. He was taken to see bridges and things like that. Of course, he saw Niagara Falls. Um, but the sort of big balls and celebrations were um, were not held to be out of respect for um, the illness of the, the royal family. Thank you. All right. And now we're getting a few inquiries about the woman here. Yeah. So the first question uh, is actually about, well, actually, here's another one that just came in. So I'll begin with this one, then we'll get into 
other inquiries about his love life and marriage and so on and so forth. Uh, Lady Agnes writes, since he was such a ladies man, did he not marry because of his lost love? Uh, could he not find someone the crown would approve of or other? So I, I'm sure that there were many opportunities for him to marry. I mean, his family would have wanted him to marry and, and, um, and, but he never seemed to be interested in marrying ever, anyone. Um, and I, unfortunately, um, one of the things that I didn't mention in the presentation, but it's relevant here is Alexis did not write very much. So, you know, for those of you who know something about the Romanovs, you'll know that they were great writers. They wrote lots of letters and they kept lots of diaries. Um, unfortunately, Alexis was not one of those. So um, I hunted far and wide and um, he has uh, very little uh, writing. So there was, one, um, there was one diary that I found, but it, it went, to a period before the visit. So there was no diary that I could find from the visit, nor has anyone else been able to find one. Um, there were letters that he wrote while he was in America. The longest is an eight page letter to his mother in which he refers to a couple of things along the visit, but it's not very detailed. And, and I mean, considering the number of places he visited, you know, we would love to know more about what he thought. Um, some of the letters to his brothers and to his father during the visit were about, you know, how much he was longing for Zhukovskia and how much he really wished that he would be able to marry her. He, he describes to his brothers about being lonely and far away from his family at, you know, at Christmas time and at the time of his birthday and how he was having to kind of perform at all of these ceremonies, even though he was feeling sad. Um, but he doesn't, but there, I, I was never able to find any writings uh, from later life that might explain why he never married. Thank you. So kind of going off of your response here, uh, Ellie would like to know a little bit more about Alexi's temperament. Uh, so you spoke very briefly here about how much there is that we don't know. Uh, I'm wondering, have you encountered anything describing his temperament from other sources, his own sources? Ellie would like specifically to know if uh, some of Alexi's temperamental personality was perhaps connected to the breakup and its effect on his health. Interesting. Okay. Um, so, um, so I don't know much about his temperament other than the things that I've read uh, in primary sources about him. I mean, by and large, um, while he didn't have a great reputation as being like a serious uh, leader of the Russian Navy, in other ways, people said nice things about him. They said he was friendly. He was a good dancer. He could sing. Um, that he, um, that he, uh, you know, he was, he was pleasant and nice. I mean, every on the American visit, everybody wrote nice things about him in, in memoirs that I've read where they refer to him. People always had very nice things to say about him, except when it came to his professional life. And it just seemed like, you know, he was sort of, I mean, it just reminds me of so many other uh, royal children who have no real responsibility for so long that when they are given real responsibility, they don't welcome it. Uh, maybe they never really wanted to do it and it's an obligation or, you know, it's not what they would have chosen for themselves. And so they never kind of put their heart into it hundred percent. So he kind of just reminds me of another Royal child who didn't really get to make all the decisions for his own life that he might have liked to. Wonderful, thank you. So getting back to this idea of parents and familial influence, uh, Dimitri would like to know, did Alexei's travel influence his father's decision to sell Alaska at all? So no, because actually the visit predate, I mean, the visit comes after the Alaska sale. So the Alaska sale was in 1867 um, and Alexis's visit came in 1871. The only connection there was that, um, was that, you know, it, it was part of that Russian American relationship that they wanted to really cement and 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 emphasize at the time. Wonderful. All right. So one more question involving politics uh, from Denise, who would like to ask again, were there any substantive political benefits that accrued directly from the visit? So there weren't any major political um, things that uh, that occurred as a result of the visit. It was more sort of a a friendly relations kind of benefit. Um, and it wasn't 100%. I mean, I said the visit was successful, and it certainly was. But there, you know, there were some sour grapes from the visit as well. So, you know, the Russian royal family was a little miffed uh, 
that Alexis wasn't treated better in Washington, D.C., and that was commented on in Russian newspapers. And years later, when President Grant visited Russia, um, he was not invited to dine. Uh, and that was considered to be a direct reflection of his refusal to have a dinner for Grand Duke Alexis, even though the Kadakazi thing was certainly a very good and understandable reason. Um, there were still some sour grapes many years later. Um, and there were also the Kadakazi thing uh, also seemed to uh, cause some tension for American businessmen. So our, our representatives in St. Petersburg said like, you know, there are some people here are kind of angry about the way the United States treated Alexis and Kadakazi. And so, you know, businessmen are having trouble getting contracts and so on. All right, so now we have a question from Daria here. So she asks, was the Grand Duke's son allowed to keep his title? Was he adopted by the husband? You get into this a little bit during the lecture, uh, but overall, do you have any information on what became of his children and grandchildren? Are there other sources you could point to to direct some of our audience members who are wondering what happened to that son, Alexis the Younger, or however we would like to call him. So, um, so as I said, he, you know, he returned to Russia. He became part of the Russian family again. Um, he married and had children. Um, he actually has descendants living in France and the United States. So I was able to meet an interview um, one of his, I guess, great, great granddaughters um, in the United States, uh, in New York City. Um, I'm not sure if she's still alive because I haven't been in communication with her in a number of years. And she was already very old when I spoke with her. She told me that there were other members of the family out there, but none of them are particularly interested in this story. Um, I, it is interesting to note that she believed uh, and she said her, members of her family believe that Alexis and Zhukovskaya were secretly married. And so the, all of the children and grandchildren from that union then would have been legitimate. Um, and so I, you know, again, there's, there, there were rumors that they somehow secretly got married, but it's never been proven. Uh, but descendants apparently believe that they were actually married. Plenty more to catch up on, things to read, and things to see. Uh, so I'll wish you all a very happy and safe holiday season, and we will hopefully see you in 2022. Uh, one final round of virtual applause for Lee, uh, and have a good rest of your weekend, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much.